This is video podcast 50 from learningradiology.com. 30 key imaging diagnoses everyone should recognize, part one. Hello, I'm William Herring from Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. This podcast expands on AMSER's diagnostic short list of 22 must-see images all students should recognize, developed by Kit Schaefer and Petra Lewis. AMSER is the National Alliance of Medical Student Educators in Radiology. What makes these diagnoses key? Well, all of them are common and clinically important. They're readily recognizable from conventional radiographs or CT. They produce classical diagnostic patterns. There will be 15 included in this podcast and 15 in the next. And you can get more information on any of the material discussed on learningradiology.com and even more material in the textbook Learning Radiology Recognizing the Basics. This is Diagnosis 1. Why is this patient short of breath? And you can turn your computer or MP3 player off while you consider the answer. There is a tension pneumothorax present. First of all, there are rib fractures present on the left side, and there is a large left-sided pneumothorax, which is under tension. There is a shift of the heart and the trachea to the right. This is a CT scan of the chest in a patient with a simple pneumothorax. Remember that with the person lying on their back, which is how most CT scans are are obtained, air will rise in the pleural space to the highest point, which will be just underneath the anterior chest wall, as evidenced by this black crescent that you see here. On conventional radiography, pneumothoraces must demonstrate the pencil-thin visceral pleural white line, which is the visceral pleura separated from the parietal pleura by air in the pleural space. This is diagnosis number two. Why did this 43-year-old develop chest pain after vomiting? Pause your computer or MP3 player. Well, there is air in the mediastinum, as evidenced by the streaky densities that you see the red arrows pointing to, and there is a large left pleural effusion. Whenever you have the combination of a pneumomediastinum and a left pleural effusion, especially in someone with a history of retching or vomiting, the diagnosis should be Borhob syndrome, or rupture of the esophagus. In this CT scan of another patient, we can see air surrounding the esophagus with the E on it in the mediastinum, and we can also see contrast which is extraluminal due to the perforation that usually occurs along the posterior aspect of the left lateral wall of the esophagus. This is diagnosis 3. Why does this patient have abdominal pain? There is a pneumoperitoneum present. There is a large amount of free air beneath the left hemidiaphragm, but that can sometimes be confused with air that is inside the stomach or splenic flexure. However, there is a large amount of air beneath the right hemidiaphragm, and that indicates the presence of free air. This is another sign in another patient which shows that both sides of the stomach here are outlined by air so that the wall of the stomach becomes visible. This is called Wrigler sign. If you look at the normal stomach, we can normally see air outlining the inner wall but not the outer wall of the stomach because there is no air normally in the peritoneal space. These are two CT scans of individuals, one who has a small amount of free air, the other a large amount of free air. Since the scans are done with the patient supine, the air will again rise to the highest point, which is just underneath the anterior abdominal wall. And importantly, in both cases, the air is not contained within the bowel. Why is this 57-year-old female short of breath? There are large bilateral pleural effusions. We have a meniscus shaped density at the right base and one at the left base from these effusions. In this case, it was secondary to congestive heart failure. Here is a CT scan of the chest which shows bilateral effusions. Again, they're meniscus in shape. They tend to have a lower density because they contain fluid. And there is compression atelectasis above the pleural effusion on the right side. 
Don't forget about the effect of the patient's position and layering on the appearance of the size of pleural effusions. These are the same patient x-rayed about an hour apart. One is done with the patient supine, the other following removal of the central venous catheter with the patient upright. In the supine position, the fluid tends to layer out posteriorly and appears larger than it does when it falls to the bottom of the pleural space in the upright position. Why does this 38-year-old male have hemoptysis? Well, there is a cavitary pneumonia in the right upper lobe, which the red arrow is pointing to. On the lateral film, we can see that it's posterior. Whenever you have a cavitary lesion in the upper lobe, tuberculosis is the diagnosis of exclusion. Tuberculosis has a propensity for transbronchial spread from one upper lobe to the opposite lower lobe. In the image on the left, the yellow arrow is pointing to disease in the left lower lobe as well as in the right upper lobe. And the cavities in tuberculosis tend to be thin-walled upper lobe cavities. Why is this patient short of breath? Well, there is fluid in the fissure, in this case the fissure, which is the inferior accessory fissure, and there is diffuse prominence of the pulmonary interstitial markings caused by intersecting curly lines. This patient is in pulmonary interstitial edema secondary to congestive heart failure. The four reliable signs of congestive heart failure on conventional radiography are curly B lines, pleural effusions, fluid in the fissures, and peribronchial cuffing. In this case, there are diffuse bilateral airspace densities in a perihylar distribution which tends to spare the outer aspect of the lung, which is called the bat wing or the angel wing appearance of pulmonary alveolar edema. Why does this 63-year-old man have chest pain? This is a single image from a contrast-enhanced CT scan of the chest. Well, this image is labeled, and if you look carefully, you can see that there is a thin lucency in the contrast-filled descending aorta, which represents the antimal flap of an aortic dissection. This is a type B dissection. Aortic dissections, which are type B dissections, spare the ascending aorta and are usually treated medically. Aortic dissections, which involve the ascending aorta, are type A dissections and they're usually treated surgically. Conventional radiography is not a very sensitive means of demonstrating an aortic dissection, but if you see a patient who has a widened mediastinum, a left pleural effusion, especially if they are complaining of chest pain, then you should be worried about the presence of an aortic dissection. Why is this 71-year-old short of breath? Well, they clearly have an opacified left hemithorax, and there is a shift of the trachea, the red arrow, and of the heart, the green arrow, away from the side of opacification, which indicates there is something that's occupying space on the left side, and this is indicative of a large left pleural effusion. In this case, it was due to an underlying bronchogenic carcinoma. Why is this 73-year-old short of breath? Well, again, there is an opacified left hemithorax, but in this case, there is a shift of the trachea, red arrow, and the heart, white arrow, toward the side of opacification. That indicates the presence of volume loss, and this is characteristic of atelectasis of the entire left lung. This patient also had an obstructing bronchogenic carcinoma. So look at the differences again between the patient who had the large pleural effusion on the left and atelectasis in the entire lung on the right. 
Remember, too, that especially with underlying malignancy, there may be a balance between the amount of pleural fluid and the amount of underlying atelectasis. So even with an opacified hemithorax, there may be no shift of the heart or mediastinal structures. Why did this 85-year-old have an abrupt onset of abdominal pain? You're looking at two contrast-enhanced CT images of the abdomen. There is thrombus, which is demonstrated by the yellow arrow that separates the contrast in the aorta from the wall of the aorta, but that's not what the big problem is. The big problem is that the material to which the red arrows is pointing is contrast, which has actively extravasated from the aorta into the retroperitoneum. The green arrows are pointing to blood, which is less acute than that which is denser on the CT scan. This is an example of rupture of the abdominal aorta, and this patient did not do well subsequent to these CT scans. Why is this newborn tachypneic? Well, one of the first things you have to ask yourself whenever you're looking at any image is, number one, is it abnormal? And number two, uh, which side is abnormal? So which side is abnormal? Is it the left or the right? Even though the heart and trachea are displaced to the right, producing the density that you see there, the abnormality is on the left side because there you can see multiple lucencies which represent air in loops of primarily small bowel which are now located in the chest. This is characteristic of a diaphragmatic hernia, although it could represent congenital absence of the diaphragm or rupture of the diaphragm. Why did this 36-year-old have acute abdominal pain? You're looking at a supine and an upright view of the abdomen. On the supine view, we can see that there are multiple air-containing and dilated loops of small bowel. On the upright view, we see that they contain multiple air fluid levels, and the blue arrow is pointing to the fact that there is no air in the rectum or sigmoid. These findings are characteristic of a mechanical small bowel obstruction. Why is the abdomen of this 83-year-old man distended? Well, there is a very large dilated and obstructive loop of large bowel, which has the shape of a coffee bean and which represents a sigmoid volvulus. The sigmoid has volvulated around the point approximately where that yellow star is. If we were to do a barium enema on this patient, the barium would reach only to the point where the sigmoid twisted and then it would be obstructed. This is an example of a much less common type of volvulus, a cecal volvulus, in which the cecum rotates and twists into the left upper quadrant and is the dilated loop you see here pointed to by the red arrow. There are also multiple dilated loops of small bowel because the cecal volvulus produces a proximal small bowel obstruction. Why did this 74-year-old report a change in bowel habits? You have a supine and an upright view of the abdomen. The bowel that you see dilated is large bowel, and there is an abrupt cutoff in the air column in the distal descending colon. And the reason for that, if we look at the lateral view of a barium enema, is that we can see that there is an obstructing annular constricting lesion that represented a sigmoid carcinoma, which was producing a proximal large bowel obstruction. This is diagnosis 15, the last in this podcast. Why does this 47-year-old have increasing abdominal girth? There is a low attenuation material that surrounds the intraperitoneal structures like the liver and the spleen. The C represents an enlarged caudate lobe of the liver, and this patient has ascites from cirrhosis.
This is an example of a patient with more massive ascites, as shown by the low attenuation fluid. The bowel is displaced away from the abdominal wall by the acidic fluid. The P represents a pancreatic pseudocyst in this patient who had pancreatitis. On a conventional radiograph, you might recognize ascites by displacement of the loops of bowel from the abdominal wall centrally in the abdomen. And on ultrasound, by convention, the patient's head is to your left, the patient's feet to your right, anterior is up and posterior is down. And this is a sagittal image in which you can see the liver and then the anechoic fluid that resides between the top of the liver and the right hemidiaphragm that represents ascites. So we covered 15 of the 30 key diagnoses in this podcast. In the next podcast, we'll cover the next 15 diagnoses.